Christmas with the scent of potpourri. Filled to commit to memory. Crossing the felt roads. Watching from home on my TV. Looking at all my eyes can see. They tell me I view obsessively. Hello and welcome to the Obsessive Viewer and to 2024, um, if you're listening on the day of release. Um, we're a weekly podcast that reviews one or two new release titles every episode with an occasional free-for-all segment at the end that we call Potpourri. You can find more of our work, including written reviews, full episode show notes, and the complete backlog of our episodes at obsessiveviewer.com. You can also write into the show by emailing me at matt at obsessiveviewer.com. And if you'd like to support us and get access to hundreds of exclusive episodes, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer, where you can get access to content at any of our tier levels on a recurring monthly subscription basis, or you can buy individual collections a la carte in the Patreon shop section. Uh, this week on the Patreon, I have released a full episode rundown of my po- podcast writing and Patreon stats for the year, which is uh, beneficial to no one, but it's something that I like to keep mm-hmm. track of and everything. Um, and in that episode, I will have also disclosed my honorable mentions ahead of our year in review episode that's coming in a couple of weeks. And then also this week on Patreon, I am kicking off my uh, recurring s- Uh, recurring series of Mike Flanagan related reviews with uh, my inaugural edition of the Flanagan Fridays series on Patreon, which I'm going to be talking about my um, review of Absentia, one of his early uh, movies that I believe should still be available on Amazon Prime. And then also this week on Saturday, I'm going to be launching Sci-Fi Saturdays, which uh, is going to be sci-fi reviews and stuff i'm starting with episode reviews of foundation season two on apple tv plus so again you can sign up on patreon.com slash obsessive viewer for all that and a whole bunch more and i also just want to say uh, since it's the new year and everything thank you guys so much for all all of our listeners and patreon members for making 2023 such a great uh year for the podcast and for giving me a reason to keep doing this <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, I want to highlight a special thank you to uh, Carol, one of our Patreon supporters, who gave a very uh, generous holiday donation to the shows. It is greatly appreciated and uh, very, very, uh, very, very thankful for uh, for for her contribution. Uh, so once again, patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. I'm your host, Matt Hurt, and you can find me on social media, which includes Letterboxd at Obsessive Viewer. And in our featured review this week, we'll be reviewing the final entry in DC's DCEU, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, which is currently in theaters. And for this week's secondary review, we'll be covering Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon dash part one colon a child of fire which is currently streaming on netflix with part two colon the scar giver coming out in april and an r-rated cut coming at some point in the future um that's my intro spiel joining me tonight is my friend and ifj colleague andy carr making a return appearance on the podcast uh you can follow him on letterboxd at letterboxd.com slash dandable and you can also hear him and his co-host logan celebrate the interconnectedness of film in their podcast odd trilogies in which they discuss groups of three movies whether bonded by story spirit Uh, themes or shared cast and crew each episode you can find odd trilogies wherever you get your podcasts or at oddtrilogies.castos.com welcome back to the show andy and happy new year technically we're still in 2023 how have you been (laughs) i've been great thanks for thanks for having me back as always um this uh i get this winter's kind of been uh, a little bit uh, laden with Andy on Obsessive Viewer. It I've has been around a lot. Very, very welcome. <laughs> uh, like I, I am just very, uh, very pleased to have you on as, as frequently yeah. as I have, I've, as I've had you on. Um, we kind of did like. I don't know. I, the 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 way that the winds have shifted at Obsessive Viewer, uh, it's just kind of become more of a just like rotating guests mm-hmm. thing. And I'm so grateful for you and everyone else that's been a guest on the show, um, especially you, 
You just had Mitch on recently, right? Yes, we uh, we ran down the uh, the no wait we you and I re- ran down the top ten. See, mm-hmm. everything's blurring together. <laughs> Mitch and I reviewed Poor Things and uh, Saltburn. Uh, well, okay, he missed yeah. out. Then we get to yes. talk about the good stuff. Exactly, exactly. You know, it's funny because I kind of feel like this these two movies. They are, they are the, uh, as as Mitch famously uh, <laughs> coined in this uh, on the podcast. He he's the first person to utter these words on this podcast, and ever since then, I'm going to be saying it every single time. But some some would say that this these two movies that we're reviewing tonight are the cummy bathwater of 2023 movies. <laughs> 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 yeah yeah that's fair yeah <laughs> it's a dog shit double feature i tell you it, it is it absolutely is um yeah but before we get into that uh i was i was gonna do like i wasn't going to do this but i thought it would be hilarious in my mind because i'm an idiot but it would be hilarious if i just introed the show and i just i uh i threw it to you i was like hey andy ha- happy new year i heard I hear you had a freaking crazy New Year's Eve. Can you tell us in immaculate detail everything that happened uh, exactly how you were telling me beforehand since we're recording this before the New Year? <laughs> anyway, that's stupid. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but what's... <laughs> I, I will let you know how it goes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have any New Year's plans? Uh, yeah, we generally... Emma and I, my, my wife and I generally... Mm-hmm. Um, host a party for a a handful of our friends so we'll we'll do the thing i think this year we're we're theming the party as a time traveler's ball so people are showing (laughs) up from from various time periods i'm going as like a (laughs) mid-century 50s dad um so i like it (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it'll, it's always a good time, and I'm sure it will be, and I'm sure it was, mm-hmm. speaking from now January 4th. Yes, I, it's, it's funny, because, and like, I, I know, I feel like within like our uh, little circle in our group chat and everything, mm-hmm. you, you kind of catch a, a little bit of shit for being younger than most of us. Uh, yeah, I think, I, am I still, I'm, I, I think I'm the youngest think IFK you are the, member. I think so, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I believe so. But um but like usually I'm like, you know, I I'm not, I'm not I'm you know, he's not that young. I'm I'm not, I can right. hang. Um <laughs> but like the idea of a themed New Year's Eve party sounds oh, yeah. fucking exhausting to me. <laughs> I feel like the main way like my that little <clears throat> friend group of mine mm-hmm. stays young is by having parties that like college <laughs> kids would have or like yeah. just post college kids would have. we're not we're not college level anymore but sure. you know you know that that 22 23 range is and we have i have some friends who are that age so mm-hmm. i guess we just the youth is spread amongst us Nice, nice. I am looking forward to a quiet evening with maybe like some sparkling cider to kick yeah. off the new year if I'm awake <laughs> and uh, maybe some homemade pizza. I'm not sure. but um, And a cat named pizza. And a cat named pizza. My special little pizza roll. I did have a quick anecdote if you'll indulge me about sure. that. Uh, it ties back into my Patreon spiel and everything. But um, pizza recently had a urinary tract infection. Um, yeah. And she was very brave. She was incredibly brave. I took her to the vet and everything. And it's funny because it's so weird. Like I scheduled the vet appointment for pretty much immediately after work. Mm -hmm. And I worked from home that day and I got the carrier out. I, I let it sit out there for a while so that she wasn't afraid of it. Um, then I picked her, picked her up, put her in there. She was very cool about it. She didn't, she like, she yelled and everything and was screaming, um, but she was cool about it. And so I put her in the car and then the whole way to the vet, and this is where I, this is my brain. I played, <laughs> I played, uh, just a couple of episodes of my Patreon feed <laughs> so that she would constantly be hearing my voice. <laughs> oh. Yeah. And she was very good. She was very good. <laughs> and, and like, I just thought like, That's it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just like, and, 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 <laughs> and if you guys are listening and you're interested on Patreon <laughs> and Patreon, I will say that I had my choice of up to like 700 and some episodes I could have chosen from. Um, 
but I did force her to listen to me talking and <laughs> ranting about Rebel Moon in my immediate yeah, reaction yeah. episode. So, yeah, <laughs> but welcome. yeah, but she's she's doing okay now. She's she's fine. She's oh, just good. yeah. She was just uh uh you know I don't know. She's she's had him. Before. Has she ever? Oh, she has. Okay, that's yeah. what I was gonna ask. Yeah, a few years ago she had a UTI and then um <clears throat> just took her to the vet, gave her some antibiotics, and she was all set. Um. <laughs> And it was interesting because when I went that time, they gave me like an oral uh, antibiotic that I had to like give to her. Mm -hmm. Um, In this one, they were just like, yeah, we can just give her a shot and it'll it'll work within two weeks. And I'm like, okay, sure. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Mm. So, yeah. And I'm still alive. So she hasn't killed me in my sleep. So that's good. Um, <laughs> she still tolerates you. Exactly. All exactly. All that you did to her. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and speaking of... Uh, let me see if I can transition out of this. Uh, and speaking of <laughs> um, things that people do to... No, that's not a good one. Um, speaking of... <laughs> Uh, speaking of like not speaking of tolerating things but speaking of things that are special and awesome like pizza odd trilogies podcast oh um yeah. oh i totally thought you were gonna say like speaking of things that are painful let's oh, talk no. aquaman no uh, no but... <laughs> <laughs> oh no i will have i'll have to think of a you know what's funny is i'll have to think of a i'll have to think of a segue for aquaman but it will <laughs> turn out to be just like an amalgam of different segues that are that were popular like 30 years ago. Um, yeah. And then that will, that would do it. But anyway, odd trilogies. <laughs> yeah. uh, recently you guys have had, uh, uh, you're up to 74 episodes here in a couple mm-hmm. of days as of this recording or this, this episode releasing, uh, yeah. you're going to have episode 75, which is your, uh, do you do like a year in review or is it just like a, yeah, yeah. we, we <clears throat> typically, so neither of us really does like a, you know, a published written top 10. We both, you know, run through the year on letterbox and make a ranking or whatever. Mm. But, um, so we do a, a top 10 kind of together on air, uh, in our year in review episode, and also just kind of highlight other big movie things that happen throughout the year that were Mm. either meaningful to us or interesting to talk about. Um, and then usually kind of look a little bit forward into the next year of like things we're excited for and maybe things we're going to be doing on the podcast. So, nice. um, yeah, we, I, I think traditionally how we've done it is he comes up with a top 10. I come up with a top 10. We do not reveal them to each other until oh, we're nice. recording. And then we kind of, you know, open our open presents to each other as it were, <laughs> um, throughout the episode. And a lot of, most of the time we have like four or five duplicates where we both nice. have them on our top 10, but like, who cares nice that you know in terms of podcasting especially like movie related podcasting the year in review episode is like this sacred like thing (laughs) like we're recording ours in a couple of weeks and like i'm excited i look forward to it every year it's like it's always three and a half hours long it's ridiculous Mm -hmm. but it's like it's like the one episode that me and Tiny and Mike, who were the three like OG hosts of the Obsessive Viewer, like we come on and it's like a yearly thing. It's it's very exciting. I'm very excited for it. So, yeah, I I always look forward to it. And like you said, yeah, it's always like our longest episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um but uh i promise i'm not going to do any i'm I, after this i'm not going to do any more hackneyed uh transitions but speaking of <laughs> longer episodes there is uh-huh. going to no longer be a director for Scream mm-hmm. 7. <laughs> um, hey. And a lot of we people, yeah, and a lot of people are no longer going to be watching Amazon Prime without ads. Um, Yikes. So do you want to yeah. talk about a couple of news things that have happened recently <laughs> is what I'm getting yeah. at. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the Scream 7, man, yes. just dropping like flies. It is ridiculous so for the listeners basically uh, a couple of days ago as of this recording director christopher landon who previously did uh, happy death day happy death day to you and freaky i believe um he announced on twitter that he he uh formally exited 
Scream 7 weeks ago. He was brought on as the director after uh, Radio Silence, who did Scream 5 and Scream 6, moved on to, I think they're going to be doing like a Universal Monsters project at some point. Um, so Christopher Land was brought on. There was rumors that it was going to be set at Christmas. Um, given Christopher Landon's pedigree in terms of the horror that he has created, um, the horror movies he's created, I was very excited for him because this this is a very unique um person to to handle this franchise which is my yeah. probably my favorite franchise franchise it's the most important franchise to me right. um yeah and then all hell broke loose they fired uh Melissa Barrera and then the next day uh <laughs> uh oh my god uh, Jenna Jenna Ortega, Jenna Ortega yeah. exited the project and now Christopher Landon is is donezo um uh, yeah. Yeah, how do you feel about this, Andy? And and um, uh, yeah, how 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 are you dealing with this? And how are you with the <laughs> Scream franchise in in general as well? <laughs> I I like the Scream movies a lot. I'm I mean the f- first one, you know, is an all time favorite it's horror slasher um, for me. Um, very formative in my teen years, um, and I like. Uh, two and three i don't think they're as good but i really like two i think three is fun not huge on four um and then i've enjoyed the the last two um quite a bit um Mm -hmm. i I thought they were really fun revitalizations of the kind of tongue-in-cheek sat horror satire thing that scream likes to do um so i've really been into it i had a lot of fun with the last one in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really like uh, Jenna and Melissa as the leads. I think they are a compelling kind of protagonist duo. Yeah. And so I'm a little bummed that they're not involved, but I will say uh, the, at least the, the reasons that can be inferred or gathered mm-hmm. from their exit um if those are true, if my read of that situation is true, I support them leaving and, you know, fuck the studio on that one. Um, yep. I, I don't know if Landon's exit has anything to do. I, what I'm getting at is that um, Melissa Barrera had like shared on Instagram or tweeted some opinions about the Israel Palestine conflict mm-hmm. and, frankly, very innocuous things, um, speak showing her support for, for the Palestinian people. Um, and then was, yeah, fired. And then they said that that had nothing to do with it. And it's like, well, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> well, they, Jenna, sorry, yeah. I, I was just going to interject and say that yeah, they yeah. spyglass, the studio, like outright said that they have zero tolerance for any anti-Semitism. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They called her anti-Semitic. Yeah. It's like over <clears throat> that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. And, oh, and then it was Jenna that, like, mm. they said was not uh, related to that at all. But it was just like <laughs> the timing was a little too convenient. Like, yep. the day after your leading lady leaves, your next lead says, I'm done. Um, yep. Yeah. It's, so. it's unreal. If I wasn't such a if if the scream franchise wasn't so important to me, like, it, it literally yeah. is so important to me. Um, I would be not necessarily basking, but I would be very much uh, more interested <laughs> in just the colossal fuck up that yeah. Spyglass Media Group has done sure, uh, sure. to themselves. And it's funny in like a previous episode of the podcast, I don't remember which one, but I kind of went on not a rant, but it, I was basically just outlining everything that has happened up to that point, which was. Melissa Barrera and Jenna Ortega leaving the project. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just like, when that happened in my brain, it like, I felt a little bit guilty for being so, I guess, forgiving of, of them uh, basically not being willing to pay Nev Campbell enough to come back for scream six. Yeah. Um, Because, like it's it is insane to me that <laughs> this studio has like they oh my god like they got the rights to scream they successfully with rebooted radio it. silence rebooted it scream yeah. 6 was the biggest 
box off. Oh, okay, here we go. Scream 5. <laughs> the opening weekend numbers for Scream 5 eclipsed the worldwide or uh, domestic, I think, overall box office from Scream 4 in its opening oh, like weekend. The gross. Yeah. Wow. And huh. Scream 6 was the biggest opening of the franchise. And like they have Jenna Ortega, who is, who is one of so and I don't mean this like physically, but like right. so hot right now. She's, like, I mean, I'm that too. But like, yeah, well, yeah. Know, she's just really hot in Hollywood. <laughs> yes. She's all over the place. She's, she's this huge rising star and she's great. Extraordinarily high demand. <laughs> Yeah. And like, not only is she in extraordinarily high demand, she has like so many of her credits are horror or horror adjacent. Yeah. So like she is yeah. like this like genre kind of a, darling in addition to yeah. like massive star. Right. And I can't imagine or I can't think off the top of my head of a studio colossally fucking themselves <laughs> the way that Spyglass has done. <laughs> like, I just... Yeah. I, it is... They had a license to print money. And right. it's gone. Like, I... Like, in my opinion, Scream 7, I don't... I don't want it. I... I Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not even... I'm not, you know, nearly as, like, invested in the franchise as you are, even though mm -hmm. I do love a lot of it and hold many entries close to my heart. Mm -hmm. Um, But, yeah, it's just like my interest in the next one immediately just kind of evaporated when I was yep. like, Oh, the two main characters whose overarching journey I was actually pretty into yep. are just going to be gone <laughs> now. And you're not going to have any like good way of explaining that. Yep. Uh, even if, even if you bring back like, you know, the old guard or something, mm -hmm. it's going to be like, well, what about the other two? Right. <laughs> you know, they, and I just, yeah. it's, it just seems like such a such a waste it, such a missed it, opportunity and series it, of stupid decisions it really 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 is and like i it, it like like you said my interest immediately just went away like i just in this is to to underscore it i've said this for over 10 years now on the podcast repeatedly i would not be doing this i would mm -hmm. we would probably not even know each other if yeah. It wasn't for Scream. Like, that movie, the original movie, literally changed the entire trajectory mm -hmm. of my life. Yeah. And I don't care if they make Scream 7, because the people that are in charge do not deserve to yeah. make it. It's amazing the, like, how quickly your, like, love or passion for a, a property or something can be, like totally i don't want to say it destroyed but like yeah, you know deflated. totally deflated by like one or two very sudden terrible corporate decisions i mean yeah. i kind of feel similarly although it's not been quite as sudden about like you know where marvel's at like oh yeah, yeah. The, the infinity saga that shit was huge <clears throat> for me i love so many of those movies iron man is very formative for me all that sort of thing but now and now i'm just like looking at the next three years of their slate and just like, and yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and Ugh. so I'm sure you're in a similar spot, maybe even more extreme yep. uh, where, yeah. I mean, I, uh, part of me is curious what seven would theoretically look like now that they've really fucked themselves out of all these key players. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm not like excited anymore. It's I'm same. just kind of like, well, I guess we'll see how awful that is. Right. I, yeah, I I don't know. It I mean, it depends on who they get, like what they do. Like and it's interesting, Christopher Landon when he when when uh the Melissa Barrera thing happened, he had tweeted he tweeted something that was like and then he deleted it because presumably Spyglass was like, "Hey, you know, maybe uh, not yeah. do that." But he tweeted something that was like, "Everything sucks. Please everyone stop yelling. I know this is a terrible right. situation." I remember that. Yeah, and then his announcement of leaving it, he he did mention that he left the project weeks ago. So Right. Yeah, and it's just <laughs> it is just and this will be the final thing and then we can go into the prime stuff, but like Oh yeah. It is my like it is it is amazing to me that Spyglass, like when when Jenna Ortega 
exited the project, uh, they tried to spin that so hard and failed so badly. They were just like, you know, it's because of her uh, season two uh, Wednesday uh, schedule and everything. <laughs> yeah, fucking right. It's like, yeah, okay, two, like literally less than 24 hours from you firing your star, the other, the co-star who is giving you a license to print money for this franchise, yeah. uh, who is also tweeting and, and, uh, posting on social media in support of Palestine, right, right. Uh, exits the project, and you think that we'll buy that it's because she couldn't, she couldn't reconcile her, her schedule, yeah. like. Well, and also, yeah. like they're clearly pretty good friends. In oh real yeah, life. like I, I feel like I see them, you know, doing things together on like yeah. social media and stuff a lot. So it, it's you know. It's not hard yeah. to put those pieces together that like one no. is clearly supporting the other or yeah. otherwise pissed off. Yep. Also, it's just it's hilarious to me that they they expect us to buy that, that it was a scheduling thing when Scream movies are not that like this I don't know what the le- release window was supposed to be, but they're not they're not, you know, they're not time sensitive like yeah they're not like things. seasonal events yeah they can it's... come out whenever you want them exactly to. <laughs> and like if they had like a specific date set for it then yeah okay maybe but it wasn't announced right? it wasn't announced they like... they the rumor was that it was going to be a, a christmas themed movie okay, but yeah but it that, that didn't doesn't necessarily mean that but also again scream 6 had the biggest box office of the entire franchise like right they you can work around room. yeah <laughs> they can work around the schedule of someone to make the seventh installment <laughs> yeah uh, just insane absolutely insane so uh we will keep you guys posted <laughs> on all the scream <laughs> shenanigans but my official my official uh statement is that spyglass can just sit on the rights once they expire sell them to someone who actually gives a shit about the franchise mm-hmm. and just never touch it they like spyglass you're done um yeah. we'll yeah. see so <laughs> yeah so i've already kind of like looked into it like my 401k i'm gonna kind of take it out and everything so i'll i'll be in a position to to do to do (laughs) to make scream seven um but yeah uh the other really quick brief news that came out it actually came out today as of this recording um is that amazon prime video will start showing ads on january 29th andy how do you feel about that they did say that there will be an additional like 2.99 pro like um uh, uh non ad a, a an ad free level that costs 2.99 extra um yeah yeah so how do you feel about that and do you do you, um, yeah, do, you well, do your yeah. prime stuff speaking of uh of corporate sudden corporate decisions that deflate interest in media um, <laughs> yeah. yeah no i mean Everybody, or at least Netflix and people are following suit. Netflix did this, has been doing this kind of progressively for a few years now, um, just kind of gradually upping every tier. Or even if they're not increasing prices, they're like moving certain privileges up in tier so that it's like, okay, well, if I, I've been on the $15 tier for years and had all the premium perks, well, now yeah. there's an extra tier that has all those and I have to. Sub- uh, upgrade my subscription mm-hmm. um with prime in this specific case and i'm not justifying the action i think <laughs> it's still trash but um i will say in my case i believe still vi- prime video is like just included as part of a prime subscription, which is, you know, the Amazon shopping subscription. And that is yeah. far and away. My main use for prime is the shopping benefits. And I know we're, we're all supposed to be boycotting Amazon yeah. you know, and all <laughs> that, but like, I don't, and mm-hmm. it's really convenient for a lot of things. <laughs> um, and so prime video, they have some, they have a, pretty interesting selection of stuff like an interesting backlog of movies you can't find anywhere else and i appreciate Mm. that um they have some some streaming shows that i really like uh invincible and the boys Mm. but i really don't use it that 
much. Um, I find myself going to the other streaming services. So like I very well may just not do the, the two ninety nine. Like, I don't, I don't know that it's, it's worth it for me. Um, if prime video were one of my favorite or preferred streamers, yeah, I'd, I'd probably be more viscerally miffed about this. Cause it's just a, it's just a, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. It's so it's it's <clears throat> aggravating that it's like I know and I know I don't think Prime Video has quite as many like tiers to their service as a lot of like Netflix and that yeah. sort of sort of thing but it's quite irksome to <laughs> take your premium like your top level version of it and say okay now that has ads too. Yeah. Unless you want to buy the add-on. And it's just like, come on. Like, it's already not a cheap, you know, subscription. Right. Uh, and granted, that's because of all the, like, shopping perks and stuff. But, like, it's 140-some bucks, I think, yeah. every year. Um, And that's, you know, that's one of the more expensive things that I'm subscribed to. Um, mm. So it's just, and you know, you know, a company like Amazon doesn't, fucking need it they don't no. need the extra three yeah. bucks yep you know they're just well and it's really probably it you know i guess if i'm thinking with a marketing or a business brain it's really not even the three dollars they're after they're after the the ad revenue yeah. they'll get from the people who don't upgrade like you yeah. know it's, it's just gross yeah. It it absolutely is, and something I hadn't even considered until until you uh you uh, until you, what you just said is that yeah it's not like in I feel like any time a streaming service has done this like Disney Plus or uh, Netflix or mm -hmm. Hulu well I think nah, Hulu doesn't really count anyway when they've done this they have introduced a lower tier level a lower yeah. point of entry yeah. uh for ads to have them be like okay we're gonna start showing ads suddenly and, on our main service yeah. like on the one that everybody has <laughs> yeah <laughs> cool. it's yeah that that <laughs> that is it's behavior yeah it's behavior yeah. befitting a company owned by someone who flew into space for five minutes and a dick rocket yeah um right. so yeah uh, yeah. And I mean, <clears throat> to boot, like, I mean, Prime is already kind of one of the scummiest streamers out there just in terms of like the layout and the oh, way it's yeah. designed. The, the whole their whole model is designed around all these extra channels and mm -hmm. add ons that are really just other streaming services <laughs> right. that you're adding into your Prime subscription. Um and and putting it all in one place on the app when you're surfing so that it's like you can't tell what's yeah. available with your subscription, what requires an add-on, what is for rent, what is for purchase. Yep. I hate that. It's the most like um uh, I, I play video games, so my point of reference is mm -hmm. like like live service gaming and microtransactions. Okay. Where it's yeah. just like you buy a game thinking that it's a whole game and then it's like 60% of the content is not available to you until you shell out more money. It's yep. Like, oh, just yeah. Just an awful, abysmal experience. Absolutely. 100%. Like, the user interface alone is ridiculous. And, mm -hmm. like, even when, like, I get, I get so irritated because, like, even when, like, I'm like, oh, maybe I'll watch, maybe I'll watch The Boys. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll jump mm -hmm. in and watch The Expanse, which... I need to get back to my expanse reviews on Patreon, but that's a whole other thing. But anyway, um, they have like the, the whole practice of having like individual seasons on like, oh, as the, yeah. that is so annoying. Like just have the show and have seasons within yeah. that show. Like yeah, nobody, nobody sold you the rights to one season <laughs> right. of the show. Like, you know, you are fucking hoarding. Shit. Yeah. Like I don't understand it cannot be that much like easier for them to just throw up individual seasons as their own little things than it is like it can't be more beneficial than like the time saving of doing that could not be more beneficial than them just putting it all in one place, making it easier for people to find yeah. it and 
watch it. Ugh, Jesus. Yeah. The yeah. the whole like <clears throat> other part like kind of other streaming services as channels through Prime and stuff mm-hmm. also just grosses me out on the level of like oh we're reverting to cable again yeah like buy our cable package and disney's been doing that for years with like hulu Mm -hmm. and espn but at least you can make the argument that like disney owns all of that so like they're gonna bundle it and yeah you know it's not like a channel through each streamer it's like you have each streaming service and you just pay for them all in one bundle um absolutely that with prime it just feels like putting it all into this umbrella just feels really uh i don't know they're very whatever the word like like they're trying to really corner the market and it's yeah. like this market is not really cornerable right, <laughs> right. now. I'm sorry. <laughs> like it's a low effort, it's, like trying yeah. to be like a low, low effort monopoly on something that yeah. <laughs> countless other companies have already been good at making it, making it in terms of presentation and user interface. <laughs> like, yeah, right. It's, it's weird. I will say though, that their channel uh uh thing did kind of save me like six bucks mm. because I used the uh uh the free trial for shutter when oh, uh yeah. I was reviewing uh It's a Wonderful Knife um a few weeks ago yeah. with Brent. And I ended up using the free trial to do that because I didn't feel like shelling out the six bucks for sure. shutter. Um yeah. so that shutter came in is, handy. Shutter is something that I feel like I should subscribe to it at some point. Yeah. I, I just don't need it right now. Yeah. I get into uh, a rhythm where like every September, October, I subscribe to it for a month or two to watch all the <laughs> right. horror stuff. Um, yeah. But I am like, since I've been kind of re like reconfiguring some like financial stuff, um, mm-hmm. basically trying to live um, <laughs> and budget <laughs> Uh, I've been thinking like, oh, you know, I should just do, and I have started to do this. I should just do like yearly, yearly subscriptions. That way I'm not spending 15 bucks a month on something. Instead, if I have the money, I can just throw out like $139 for Amazon prime, have that for the year. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, but, um, I was thinking about doing that with shutter, but I'm not sure, but I did just do that with a criterion channel. Um, so mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to hopefully using Criterion Channel a lot more. Nice. Um, yeah. So uh, anyway, all that's coming. The Prime video ads are starting on January 29th. So <laughs> yeah, yep, yep. And and I was kind of curious to see what it would be if like if if like I have like an annual subscription to Amazon Prime. Like, what would the actual cost to upgrade to that would be for the annual thing? But it the information's right. not out there yet so yeah um but yeah but um anyway that's the news <laughs> um, yeah a lot of good stuff yes a lot of good yes things to be excited about exactly this and holiday season <laughs> yes <laughs> this entire episode is just a downer i'm just <laughs> realizing <laughs> Yeah. um so let's go ahead and go into our first review of the <laughs> night um we're going to do a non-spoiler and spoiler review for Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, which is currently in theaters. Um, the uh, When we switch over to spoilers, I'll play a clip from the trailer. Uh, check the show notes for timestamps. You can find those at obsessiveviewer.com slash OV409. Uh, so here we go. The premise for Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. Uh, Black Manta seeks revenge on Aquaman for his father's death. Wielding the Black Trident's power, he becomes a formidable foe. To defend Atlantis, Aquaman forges an alliance with his imprisoned brother. They must protect the kingdom. Okay. Uh, (laughs) That's the premise. They must protect the kingdom. Yeah. Uh, Director was James Wan, returning from the first one. Writers were David Leslie Johnson McColdrick, uh, has the screenplay by credit, and story by credits are James Wan, David Leslie Johnson McGoldrick, Jason Momoa, and Thomas uh, Pa uh, Sibet. Um, cast includes Jason Momoa, Patrick Wilson, uh, Yaya Abdul Mateen II, Amber Heard, Nicole Kidman, Randall Park, Tamara uh, Morrison, and Dolph Lundgren. <sighs> so, Andy, um, <laughs> uh, we've we've gathered here today to to um, to remember the DC 
extended yeah. universe with this two hour epitaph yes it is aquaman too. yes jesus <laughs> so how did you feel about aquaman and the lost kingdom and the dceu overall like how 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 did you feel yeah. about it so i mean i i will be forthcoming in saying that i am not i have not largely been impressed by much of this iteration of the dc universe mm -hmm. uh i think the only one that i would actually call like a great movie is the suicide squad the mm -hmm. second one that james gunn did that's like barely connected to any of these right um uh, the rest of them are like okay at best uh fucking horrible like this <laughs> one at worst um and so but but you know i i'm not it's been years of that right it was like 2013 yeah. or 2011 or something when this franchise or this version of the franchise yeah. started 2013 um, i think it was 2013 yeah, Man of Steel was 2013 yeah. yeah that was one of the um, first movies that i reviewed on obsessive viewer <laughs> yeah and man of steel is actually one that i liked originally mm. but have just soured on over time every time i watch it again or every time i think about it it just gets worse in my mind mm -hmm. uh, but anyway because the <laughs> franchise was kind of not that impressive from the start i've never been terribly like you know excited about any upcoming entries or you know massively disappointed with it when any of them come out um it's kind of just i take them as they come and it's kind of a fun little adventure to be like well is this one going to be dog shit or passable <laughs> um and you know it, it's perfectly appropriate that the final note of the dceu is dog shit um yeah. I, I i just <laughs> I didn't particular. I, I didn't like at all the first Aquaman, although mm. there were some admirable qualities. Um, so I really, you know, was not on board exactly for a sequel. Um, although when I heard how much of a clusterfuck this movie was in production and post production, I yeah. was definitely intrigued to see what kind of a mess it would be. And it was, you know, it's uh, it's about the mess you would expect from a movie with this many like rewrites and reshoots and things like that um so yeah i i i, uh, I don't i don't know where to start without like full starting <laughs> so i'll throw it back to you to give your All little right. uh, give your kind of take on it yeah <laughs> so um <laughs> You know what's funny is like I just pulled up my uh, letterbox uh, check in my uh, entry for Aquaman 2018, and I rated it three stars and I gave it a positive mm -hmm. review. Um, uh, I said the humor and good natured energy of Momo's portrayal of Aquaman, coupled with the tone uh, of the trailer for Shazam, has me cautiously excited for the future of the DCEU. <laughs> oh, Matthew, <laughs> you are so young. Um, uh, Jason Momo is so charismatic and has so much fun in the role that it's infectious. I enjoyed the first Aquaman. Um, I have not seen it since 2018. Yeah. Um, but I enjoyed it. And here's the thing I think about with the DCEU overall. And I feel like this is kind of the perfect, perfect button on the entire endeavor is that I feel like for as as misguided as the whole franchise cinematic universe was, I think at its heart, the major component that is definitely just why it didn't work um, is that it seemed to be at almost at, at so many different turns, a combination of someone with someone wanting to make, I guess, a specific vision in that they just wanted to make it a Zack Snyder thing. <laughs> right. Um, against, I don't know if it's a studio mandate or just people in power above whoever, or just dumb people in charge of the actual day to day of, of the productions. They, it kind of feels like they kept, they kept harping on what comic book movies were like before the MCU. Like in chasing the MCU, it feels like they 
just feel like okay well this is what it like it's like they were completely ignorant of what made the mcu work and mm-hmm. instead was like well let's repackage the kind of schlocky comic book stuff with this Zack snyder facade and see if yeah. it works well yeah it's this i this identity crisis right that yeah. just pervades the whole franchise because yeah and on one hand they're like it kind of the franchise almost kind of early on felt like it wanted to be the anti MCU. Yeah. Um, it was like going to be dark and serious and foreboding and treat these heroes like gods that we revere mm-hmm. rather than like little quipsters who make Fortnite references and things like that. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, but they also wanted to, you know, eat their cake too mm-hmm. and do the MCU thing of connecting all of these movies and franchises together. And on top of that, for whatever reason, they were like, we're going to let like the Zack Snyder ethos be our guiding <laughs> kind of, you know, beacon, for, at least aesthetically mm-hmm. um, for a while. And yeah, it, so it's just this. And then they didn't want to do that. And then they wanted to do it again. And then they, you know, fired Zack Snyder. And then, you know, it's just like this whole mess of nobody knowing, you know, there there was never a kevin feige and i'm not saying right. kevin feige is the only reason the mcu is successful um but th- there was never that passionate knowledgeable mm-hmm. delegator to like yes. get things done and get things done in a way that made sense as a whole and even the individual films themselves didn't really work because there was no like quality control right you know? yeah yes yes absolutely like having no one at the center to delegate and and to just have like a unified vision yeah was like the biggest death knell from the beginning like yeah well like it's like they wanted snyder to fill that role but snyder was never gonna make all of these movies right oh yeah although although he did you know he clearly with justice league and bvs like he mm-hmm. had his own vision for what the DC universe looked like yeah. that he wanted to plant seeds for, but mm-hmm. clearly was never going to make all those movies himself. So it was kind right. of this like, well, you're leaving us with all of these <laughs> pieces to work with, but you're not going to hang out and make them with us. Like, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. it was a fool's errand. It was a fool's errand. Yeah. And, and I remember like, aside from just the very, just gross looking Zack Snyder ism of everything. Uh-huh. I remember like the Batman versus Superman trailer, like that first trailer that shows like, I think it was like the statue of Superman or Batman or something. <laughs> yeah. And like, like the graffiti. On yeah. It. And like, yeah. I remember thinking like, that looks really dumb. That looks really just like, like, uh, um, Vaseline on the camera thing. <laughs> but it, the idea of it was appealing to me at like this idea that like, yeah, what if they made like the entire DCEU be about like humanity reckoning with the idea of gods living on earth and defending them. And like, what if they really just went into that and they don't, it's just, it's well, and uh, nobody, no filmmaker that they brought in to this franchise seemed remotely interested in that other than Zack Snyder. Nope. And the bummer of that is Zack Snyder being interested in it does not mean he's going to pull it off. Like, right. <laughs> yep. Far from it. In <laughs> fact, I think like, I think Batman v Superman is a pretty fascinating experiment, mm-hmm. a terrible movie, but a pretty yeah. fascinating conceptual experiment. And <laughs> that he was like, <laughs> we're going to make it as dark as possible and also political. And also uh, everybody hates Superman and Superman hates himself. And Batman, you know, has mommy issues and that's not new, <laughs> but we're yeah. going to pretend like it is, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's just yeah. a clusterfuck. And a- absolutely. speaking of like Aquaman specifically, he's maybe the clearest example just because he's gotten two of his own movies Mm -hmm. despite um originating you know he originated in a Zack snyder project Mm -hmm. right because he first showed up in yeah bvs and then justice league and then the first aquaman movie but his two solo films 
have not remotely adhered to the aesthetic like oh, set out yeah. for him from the start. Because like in the Justice League movie, you remember Aquaman when he goes to Atlantis, it's like a fucking shipwreck. Basically, <laughs> yeah. it's overgrown with algae. <laughs> it's like, what if Atlantis but realistic? And they right. like, have to create air bubbles to speak to each yes. other. Yes. Um, and he's this big, you know, lumbering beefcake of a man, kind of like uh, his character in uh, Game, uh, of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Yeah. yeah, yeah, kind of like the strong, silent type. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, you get to the the Aquaman movies, and it's just a cartoon. Yeah, it's... which is also there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but no. it's just a jarring difference between versions. Absolutely, <laughs> it's so weird to pinpoint from the beginning of the DCEU to now the end, just the complete. 180 not even 180 just like the complete difference in tone and just (laughs) seeing like it laid out like just how it shifted and changed around because no one's at the wheel of this of this train wreck i mean just just Um, to think that like aquaman aquaman 2 the two shazam movies mm. uh and one woman 84 like all those (laughs) movies like that are all still technically based on Zack Snyder's grim and gritty vision of this universe. Yes. Like, how did how did we get here? What is, <laughs> exactly. what is happening? Yeah. And yeah. And with Aqu- Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, it's like the trailer alone, like it it makes me laugh because and I'll play this clip when we go into spoilers, but <laughs> the trailer where he's like, you know, four years ago I was basically unemployed and I'm like, you're fucking Aquaman. And like, what, like, what is this? Uh, now I'm a family man and now, Oh, I've got a job. I'm King of Atlantis. And it's like, what tone is this movie going for? <laughs> um, yeah. and it doesn't, it just, it just doesn't work. And as much as, Jason Momoa does retain that kind of, not even retain he doesn't retain the like beefcake like strong silent persona yeah. or anything but like the way that it ratchets up that surfer bro the, like, like himbo side himbo of it, side of it yeah. is like it no none of the zingers landed at all for me in this yeah i mean honestly i think like the goofy aquaman stuff <clears throat> that works the best is in the two justice league cuts, you know, like the, where it's kind of trying to balance that between the serious and the silly. Um, and in the Aquaman movies, especially the second one, Mm. it's just totally flat, just all the silly campy. And I, I think Jason Momoa is a cool guy. Oh, me too. Fun. And he was a fucking blast in Fast X. Yes. I think he is like 90% of the reason that movie works at mm-hmm. all is because he's just so cranked to 11. Yep. Um, but it's just so dull here. And it feels like a, it feels like a really, like a square person mm-hmm. trying to be the goofy over the top guy. Yeah. That, that he is in fast X, but he can't for some reason. And he's just <laughs> right. this kind of like awkward dude making <clears throat> really shitty beer fart jokes. Yeah. For two uh, hours. Yeah. All while like the climate crisis is being brought to a cataclysmic head. Yeah. Oh my. Yeah. And the movie <laughs> barely like does anything with it. Like it's just, <laughs> I mean, that's the central thread of the movie, but it barely <laughs> yes. is like dealt with at all. It's like, it, it it's it's like they just touch on it they they reference yeah. it and then it's the rest of the movie is basically Jason Momoa quipping with Patrick Wilson <clears throat> yeah and Randall Park doing his best <laughs> it's oh my God. just yeah I tell you no other and I'll grant you Randall Park is probably doing his best with mm-hmm. what he was given but no other movie I've ever seen has ever made me hate Randall Park. <laughs> and I fucking hated him in this movie. Yeah. Um, and again, not his fault. Right. Like, his character just sucks. Yeah. And and he's given so many lines that are just not Randall Park lines. No. Um, and they're not random tertiary scientist character lines. Right. You know, they're the like he's he's burdened with so much of the exposition and so many of the like yeah. dramatic beats there's that scene where he gets the uh the like oh god what have we done <laughs> and it's like i just don't buy it coming no. from you <laughs> it's just in 
like Randall Park is someone that uh, aside from me not really liking shortcomings his directorial mm-hmm. debut I thought it was just not that good um aside from that he's someone that I find so much charisma in everything that I see him in because he has yeah. that just like he has that aura of playing the straight man in crazy stuff but also playing it off with the hum- with a sense of humor like i think yeah he's like the funny straight man yeah like which I, is kind of rare oh yeah i i i think about the scene from i think uh ant-man and the wasp where mm-hmm. like it's it's like famously like oh uh paul rudd improv something about like when like randall park was like i'll catch you at the end and then he's like well yeah. when where, like when like i'll be he's seeing like, you I'll, see you late. I'll be seeing you yeah. yeah it's like where do you want to get dinner or something and like they just have that back and forth and i'm like okay. that's why randall park works so well as this specific type of character in so many things because he plays it so straight and so yeah. genuine and but he's always like bumbling like he yes. plays it straight but he's not great at what he's doing or at least he is clumsy as he does it and that's yeah. kind of what makes him compelling yes and here it's like they said okay we're gonna do the randall park thing we're gonna have him do his thing but we're also going to saddle him with way too much expository stuff and way too like put him way too close to like the, the dra- drama of the movie oh, and the, drama, and the yeah. action and then just hope that the Randall Park aura works and it doesn't yeah. it's and well, it's and a they shame don't, they don't feed his aura no. at all like they don't they don't he doesn't get a lot of funny moments like no. i don't even mean functionally or non-functionally funny like mm-hmm. he doesn't have a lot of jokes or yeah. like a lot of bits that are like oh yeah that would be funny yeah it's just he's just kind of serious the whole time and kind yeah. of he's like the character who's supposed to be baffled the whole time but it's it's not baffled in a in a comically like a comic sense it's just yeah just He's just guffawing the whole movie. Yes. And with him being the, the kind of de facto right hand man of Manta, it just doesn't work. Just it, really deflates yeah. Manta's like presence. Yeah. <laughs> the dual Mateen is like, I'm not going to say it's totally working, but like he's mm. bringing it. He's bringing yeah. the like menace as best he can. He's playing yes. it up. He's super campy, super mm. intense. And then, yeah, I, I assume the idea was that you'd give that contrast with Randall Park yeah. being his goofy little assistant, like fucking Kronk and Yzma in Emperor's New Groove or something. Mm-hmm. But they didn't write to that. They didn't no. cater to that on set or in the, you know, the edit. So it's just, yeah, it's just Randall Park being miscast in a movie and uh abdul mateen like going way too hard for a nothing role yes yes <laughs> there was i think was this a line in this movie i because it's funny because like we saw this a couple of days after seeing rebel moon yeah and i don't like i think that this was a, a manta line where he's like every day that every day that i don't have my power is another day that aquaman and his family are are still alive or something like that and yeah. it's like the lamest like perfunctory villain line yeah it's also funny from like a logic perspective of just (laughs) like really like you're it's it's like your ticking time bomb is that he's alive (laughs) yes like oh he gets to live another day i gotta move faster like oh shit it's 8 a.m aquaman (laughs) just woke up I better kill him before he starts his day. Yeah, like, before he can get to the office as the yeah, king of Atlantis for his he job. Locks in another time. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, altoge- yeah. I mean, I will altogether Manta. I mean, you know, not if this isn't something that stands out because the whole movie mm-hmm. sucks. But Black yeah. Manta fucking sucks in this yeah. movie and is so wasted. I mm-hmm. didn't necessarily like him in the first one, but I was like, at least he was cool in the fight scenes and. Um, you know, is such an interesting and striking character design that yeah. it's fun when he shows up. But in this, it's like I don't even think they call him Black Manta the whole movie. I, I mean, they, they, th- they probably say Black Manta, but I, probably only when they're like David Kane, also <laughs> yeah. known as super terrorist Black Manta. Right. And then every single time they talk about him the rest of the movie, they say David Kane. Yep. 
And it's like, it, this is, it's not Peter Parker. It's not right. like his, his secret identity is an iconic thing mm-hmm. that's worth saying. Like David Kane is such a boring ass name. And that's yeah. all they call him the whole yeah. movie. It's like, just call him Manta. I think, just, I think. Is it because they're worried about black being racist? Like. I, that I kind of wondered that too, <laughs> like because they also or have the black trident, the black mamba. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I know that Aquaman refers to him as Manta once or twice, yeah. specifically because of the incredibly lame line <laughs> that is in the trailer, where it's like Manta is even more powerful than before because he has the black yeah. trident, and it's like this is the level of just unimaginative. Like comic right, book yeah. science black stuff. Black Manta got the black trident. Yeah. yeah, it's like okay, and then you throw in the oracalcum of it all, and Aura Jesus, Calcum. yes, <sighs> yeah, the unobtainium yeah. of the DCEU. <laughs> yes, it's <laughs> just it is a it is it is ridiculous, and like none of the none of the action is compelling. Uh, none no, of the I mean, in like yeah. the briefest of spurts. Yeah, there are moments there where it's like ah. It's a, a human being made this film. James Wan yes. made this film, and then yes. you go back to the like dreck, the CGI, yep, cacophony, yep, absolutely. And then like, just uh, yeah, yeah. Like there, there are a couple of scenes. Uh, well, I think really just one scene, really, um, in terms of the action, where it feels like a. One of the things that I liked about James Wan doing the like the way that he showcased the action in the first movie is Mm -hmm. the way the camera just kind of is free flowing and it isn't it's at least made to look like it's just flowing through the scene instead of cutting between and everything. Right. Um, And he does that like once in this movie and that's about it. And then it's just it. uh, I like really above all else. I just, I hated the story. I hated the plot. I hated the screenplay. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And like, yeah, it's, it asks a lot of you. And I, I think of myself as somebody who has a, um, kind of an extreme tolerance for suspension of disbelief. Like I really don't care if a, a movie doesn't, totally makes sense or plot holes i think are like the the worst thing to happen to film criticism oh my god Um, or the (laughs) the confusion over what a plot hole is like plot hole is yeah or yeah yeah, Yeah. or i mean really just the the kind of emphasis on plot Mm -hmm. in film discourse the like well the scene doesn't add to the plot or whatever you know it's like yeah fuck fuck off Um, (laughs) exactly (laughs) uh so i you know those kinds of things don't usually bother me, but when it's like at every single level of detail in this film where it's like no, nothing anybody says makes sense. Nobody has mm-hmm. a consistent character or a consistent arc going throughout the thing. You don't even have, you can't even get consistent looking babies to play <laughs> yes. Aquaman's <laughs> kids throughout the film. Um and it's yeah it's just so obviously hacked to the bone Mm -hmm. like like you know chopped together from all these different ideas that they couldn't settle on um i I mean it's pretty obvious the only thing they had that actually worked i use the term lightly um was aquaman and his brother orm just Mm -hmm. momoa and um patrick wilson because the bulk of the movie is just them like running through a green screen environment being like, <laughs> yeah. fuck you. No, fuck <laughs> you actually. Um, and it's like, that's the only like thread that actually lasts through yeah. the whole film. Everything else is like, they bring up eco- ecological disaster and they bring up mm-hmm. these desert society and they bring up uh fucking, you know, black Manta's personal vengeance. And they, they Aquaman's parents yeah. show up for all of 30 <laughs> seconds. And yeah. like, Oh my God. Mar- yeah. Mara is there kind of, but not <laughs> really because of the whole, I don't know. I assume because of her legal troubles. Yeah. Um, so it's just uh. a mess. It, like, it's just not a single thing really feels like it nothing sticks around long enough or is focused on enough to feel worth any emotional like attachment exactly it feels like it feels like like all all movies are collaborative 
but this feels like a movie that is pieced together by a committee like full of people with like senioritis for the for the franchise Uh, yeah like it's like okay let's just get this done let's do some reshoots and stuff and just like put it together because like to your point about like you know plot plot uh plot holes being the the bane of of current film criticism and everything i 100 percent agree i am someone who has long said that like a plot hole like what people think are plot holes are most often from what i can see just people not wanting to not 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 latching on to the inner logic of the movie the what the movie's presenting like right, right. like in this there's nothing in this movie that like they didn't try there is hard. no interior logic no. <laughs> it's just it's just a series of things that goes from a to b to c and then yeah and then yeah it's it just really is it's kind of the epitome well i shouldn't say epitome because mm. i think our second film of the episode is the <laughs> yeah. epitome of this but like it really just feels like kind of the the distillation of the concept of a studio like knowing what a franchise movie should look and feel and play mm-hmm. out like and just saying okay we're going to do that and not like actually put any thought or feeling yeah. into why it plays out that way it's just well he's got to go on this leg of the adventure now and he's got to face the villain now and the yep. villain has to blow this up and it's just like there's no rhyme or reason to any no. of it all it feels so meaningless and it's so crazy because it feels like this movie feels so much like it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like the end of the dceu it just feels like a greatest <laughs> hits of like a, like i kind of said at the top a greatest hits of all of the comic book movie tropes and things that yeah. have happened even like before the MCU, like just yeah, everything like since X Men, yeah, it just kind of feels like and arguably like a greatest a greatest hits album of the worst hits. Oh yeah, um, yeah. You know, like it, <laughs> any any problem you've ever had with a superhero movie, like this has it. Um, yep. It's just, it's guilty of every flaw of the genre. And it also, yeah, like you said, it just kind of feels like it's, feels like it's aping Mm -hmm. every other superhero movie. Absolutely. Um, And, and even beyond, you know, it also feels like it's aping Avatar or, Mm -hmm. you know, to lesser extent, like other fantasy, like, you know, Lord of the Rings and things. But, um, a lot of, a lot of, uh, Weirdly, a lot of Avatar. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's just because it's like the bright colors and aquatic mm. setting. I don't know. But yeah, th- that's something. The bright colors um, mm-hmm. I want to talk about because the first movie got a lot of credit. I think some of it deserving mm-hmm. for kind of feeling like this, you know, all out aesthetic, you know, riveting experience of pretty colors and pretty locales and you know, I get it because like the MCU is famously or infamously gray and right. flat in a lot of their movies and all their movies kind of lo- start to bleed together and look the same. Mm. So then Aquaman's this kind of, I guess you'd call it a gonzo blockbuster that feels like it's dripping with style. Yeah. I kind of disagree with that because there's a lot of that movie that just looks like people standing on a green screen. And it's <laughs> yeah. dark shit. Um, a lot of that movie's ugly. It just has some interesting art direction and, mm-hmm compositions but i see this movie the sequel getting a lot of passes on that same level Hmm. and i feel like this movie doesn't have nearly the like directorial verve or Hmm. cinema you know interesting cinematography that the first one had it's literally just the same color palette Mm -hmm. like it's bright blue it's bright green and pink and orange and there's lasers and fire and, <laughs> you know, aquatic venoms and things like giant animals. Yeah. yeah. Giant crab monster dragons. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, that is all like cool mm-hmm. from an art perspective. Like a, if I were flipping through a, a coffee table book of concept art, I'd be like, that's a really cool design. Yeah. Whoever drew that is a, probably a really good artist. Um, <laughs> but it's all, meaningless and it's not like presented in an interesting way yeah 
I think it's not like we get to engage with any of those right. interesting designs. It's just there is stuff on screen that's happening that kind of looks halfway interesting. Yeah. Or it's pretty colors. And I think that uh, the first movie probably got a pass or got more. I don't know. I, I think people were more receptive to that in the first movie because it came on the heels of Wonder Woman. And yeah, Wonder Woman, and Wonder had, Woman was all that blue wash. Yeah. yeah. And kind of gray World War One stuff. Right. Um, right. Yeah. And and the yeah, villain was it was another gray poop monster. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, famous like huge in the DCU. Yeah, DCU loves poop monsters. They sure do. They sure and do. And we get one in this. We do. We, we do eventually get one. Jesus. It's not Black Manta, but no. Uh, speaking of poop monster, do you want to go into spoilers? <laughs> <laughs> we can. That's fine okay. with me. I mean, I I don't know if there's anything worth else worth touching on i honestly i don't don't either but we'll just we'll we'll do a brief spoiler thing to at least talk about the end and then we can go on to better things Mm, maybe not (laughs) no no i don't think so (laughs) um so uh okay that is our non-spoiler review of aquaman and the lost kingdom uh we're gonna go into spoilers for the movie um if you want to sidestep that check out the show notes for timestamps or go to obsessiveviewer.com slash ov409 uh to bring us into spoilers i'm gonna play a clip from the trailer when we come back i'm gonna we are gonna be spoiling aquaman and the lost kingdom Four years ago, I was basically unemployed. A wanderer with no home. But now, I'm a husband and a father. And I wouldn't have it any other way. I don't know how you did it, Pops. My job was a little less stressful than yours. Oh, yeah. I finally got a job. I'm the king of Atlantis. Okay, so spoilers on for Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. Andy, what did you how did you feel about the fatherhood aspect of it? Um the mm. movie begins with like very cutesy father-son stuff, and I guess that if we want to make sense of it, is supposed to make it more um <laughs> vital when the kid gets into trouble at the end but yeah i yeah. mean it's the closest thing this movie gets to really giving arthur an arc yeah, yeah but not even it's really i don't know i guess it's just trying to add dimension to the character which recently seems like a fatherhood seems like a shorthand mm. in these kind of movies for like well you care now yeah um you know they gave Thor a kid right at the end of his last movie and yeah. I don't know if part of it's like I'm not a parent and I mm. don't have a lot of at least currently in my life I don't have a lot of interest in becoming one so like mm. this kind of perfunctory thrusting of parenthood upon super characters or whatever is just not an interesting concept to me mm-hmm. um but that being said, I do think both this and Thor Love and Thunder do that concept terribly, regardless of my feelings <laughs> yes. about the concept. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the baby is basically set dressing in this, or babies, I should mm-hmm. say. Right. There are at, at least two, maybe three, um, not even, I mean, obviously not even of the same, like, ethnicity. Right. Because uh, there's it's one very baby that's, jarring, like, very fair. And the other one is very like kind of more Jason Momoa's palette and yep. skin tone. Um, <laughs> and it's just like, that's weird. And I know babies change over time, yeah. but like still. But uh, over a two yeah. hour movie though. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Two hour movie that spans maybe, maybe a few months yeah. at most. Like, at most. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Or I think, I guess there is, there is like a five month oh yeah there is a five month time jump which i assume is the explanation for one of the baby changes but it's not a convincing baby change no not at all it's not there no (laughs) i guess it was just whatever babies were available that day yeah um jesus and yeah they don't really do anything meaningful with arthur being a dad it's just yeah like you said in one of the fights at the end the baby is 
is in harm's way. Yeah. But it's, it's not like intense yeah. or anything. And I guess there's also that. The, the shit with Arthur's dad, that fatherhood mm-hmm. angle, which is also <laughs> undercooked and stupid. And <laughs> honestly, so it has one of the funniest scenes in the movie, mm-hmm. but it's it's supposed to be the most emotionally gripping scene of the movie. Um where like he's uh, his dad got attacked, yes. right? By Black Manus people. <laughs> Uh, I forgot we were it's, in spoilers for a second. Yeah, um, but so... yeah, his like his dad's house gets r- raided by the Black Manta crew, mm-hmm. and he's left for dead, bleeding out in the <laughs> yard. And like you know, Aquaman or Jason Momoa tries to do the the Chris Pratt in Guardians of the Galaxy thing mm-hmm. of just like screaming his guts out, all this pain, yeah. and you know, all these kind of childlike tears and anxieties rushing forth that i think chris pratt actually does really well in those movies yeah um, and it's just not there no for this. like and i i really don't think it's like i i don't think jason momoa is an amazing actor but i right. do not think that scene is lacking uh you know i don't think it's suffering for a lack of him going in on it like he is he is all there and honestly like his like i think he screams no or something over his dad's (laughs) body and it's like that's a pretty good like you know cry there um (laughs) but i'm laughing because this this movie has no weight and the scene came out of nowhere and is very abrupt and it's now i've got jason momoa tearfully screaming and spitting at me and it's like this is just jarring it's it's incredible too because it feels like that whole set piece is an afterthought. It feels and it could very well I be like it was reshot. A reshot thing. Yeah. Like yeah. something added in because it is so it sticks out so much when yeah. like I think Black Manta's like, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep you alive so that he can watch you die. Um and yeah. then leaves. And then like the next scene we get Jason Momoa doing his thing and then the scene immediately after that is like the medic saying like, Oh, he'll live. He'll, he'll be fine. He's going to be okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, what yeah. are the stakes here? What the fuck is going on? Right. It's just, it, it's ridiculous. It's, it's like the only time the movie really, really feels like it's trying to be serious and yeah. like sad and like upsetting. Yeah. Um, and it just does uh, yeah just sticks out really badly and yep. doesn't land because it's not well supported by nope. the by the characters yep totally totally agree um uh the the kind of <laughs> but we can kind of put together the end and the whole climate change thing yeah which <laughs> like it's just so uh, like they they get the orichalcum so that they can cause have we, have we even explained what orichalcum is no but we <laughs> like we were like a group of us went together and we were giggling every time that word was on the screen like why would you why would you choose that word yeah because i don't think they made it up it's like a real thing i think so too yeah from history or from legend or something yeah it's it is such a dumb again it is it is it is that kind of greatest hits in in air quotes um yeah. of comic book logic that right. went out of style like with X-Men or X2 probably like around Spider-Man 2 is when it went completely out of fashion <laughs> and like it's just it's it's a weird victory lap of things that don't work in these movies yeah yeah, yeah. And it's uh the whole i mean the orichalcum like it, it's kind of it plays into the whole ecological yeah or the climate crisis aspect of the film because mm-hmm. it's this ancient fuel source that is super powerful but causes like devastating uh environmental effects mm-hmm. um has horrible you know pollution and that sort of thing and uh i guess black manta is threatening to destroy the entire planet with ecological disaster if aquaman doesn't like show up or something yeah um and it it, (laughs) i i think it's cool when you know these big 
franchise movies, especially like really, you know, genre stuff, superheroes and that sort of thing. I think they can be a really fun and powerful tool for like putting some like, I don't know, some exciting stakes to real life issues. Mm. Um, but this just doesn't, <laughs> doesn't do it. It no. uh, <laughs> The way it takes on, you know, climate change or uh, pollution as like it's, talking point is just so ham-fisted and i mean it doesn't really even it doesn't even really reckon with it it just has it in it it's just the villain is destroying the environment yep so we have to stop him okay (laughs) um it's not like it's offering any insights or asking any questions about how we how we might you know prevent that in the future or anything like that it's just it's just well, the bad guy hates the environment, <laughs> um, but it's it's also like not even it's not even uh, effective in that way because Black Manta doesn't his mission is not like destroy the environment or it's not right. like it's not like corporate callousness is yeah. destroying the environment where our humanity's love of industry and commerce is destroying the planet. It's right. He's just so pissed off at Aquaman that he's <laughs> yeah. willing to, what do they say, put a gun to the head of the planet. Yeah. It's, like, it's, it's not it's not at all philosophical or thematic. No. It's just it's just a stage on which to play. Exactly. There's no subtext to it. There's no social commentary. There's no meaning behind it. There's nothing that is making it so that like, oh, it's humanity banding together or anything like that. There's nothing profound yeah. about it. Not that there has to be, but if you're no, going to use an attempt. Yeah. yeah. Like if you're going to use that as the as the jumping off point for your villain, like it is a it is a serious, like a serious issue that people are facing, that humanity is facing. Like it's yeah. weird to use it as set dressing. Um but well, yeah. and the movie clearly thinks it has at least something to say about it because you get mm-hmm. like the Jason Momoa speech <laughs> at the end, and like yes. the, the talk about like if we can <clears throat> we can unite land and sea, then That's we can right. restore this planet. And it's it's um, somebody I think it was maybe Evan Dossie pointed mm-hmm. out that it's like basically like Christopher Reeve in yep. uh, Superman it's Four, Superman kind of hijacking 4. that film to make it a a statement a political yep. statement making that like it's it's like uh superman 4 which i haven't seen but i'm aware of it's yeah. like that in superman 4 mixed with like the uh, the kind of uh, uh wakanda revealing itself in in yeah in yeah. uh, black panther mixed with the punchline of iron man the first movie <laughs> which yeah, the fact that this this movie the end the final song of the dceu <laughs> yes. finishes with i don't i i i don't know if it's a callback uh, but it feels pretty like it feels extremely pointed <laughs> yeah uh, ends with aquaman saying the iconic final line from the very first MCU film <laughs> just feels like it's such a good note for the whole yes. franchise. Because it's like, oh, so it, it kind of flies in the face of the whole like anti MCU bit they were doing for you. Yeah, years. it is whole, so like, fascinating. That we're doing it differently, but <laughs> yeah. really we're doing the same thing <laughs> meaninglessly. And it's like, yeah, that's just the button. Yeah, in it. <laughs> yeah I don't know, like. That's the closest I, that I've come to, like, really understanding what they were going for with that. Like, you saying that it's, like, I don't know. It, it just seems so weird. Oh, I, don't, like, I don't think – what I said is not what I think they were intending oh, okay. to mean. Oh, okay. okay. I'm just saying it's a fascinating thing to observe. Yes. Like, like yes. oh, this franchise that tried to, quote, unquote, tried to do something different mm-hmm. is just ending on the most vapid version of exactly <laughs> – yes where the rival franchise started. So do you think that that was an intentional punchline, like intentionally referencing the MCU or was that something that was, do you think that they weren't thinking that deep about it? Because I I don't know. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, because if it is, I don't know what point they're making. (laughs) Like, I don't know what the point of that is. Um, You know, at some level. Yeah. I mean, when I, when I saw the scene, it didn't, 
nothing about what's happening in that scene indicates that there is there there would even like anybody would even think there's a parallel right you know between what those two scenes are doing the iron man scene and the aquaman scene literally all they have in common is that the main character is saying i am insert superhero name yeah it's not a particularly profound reveal within no. Aquaman's universe because nobody knows who he is anyway. Right. Like Tony Stark was the richest man on the planet, mm -hmm. most famous scientist in the world. Him revealing that he's a superhero, that means something to the world that he exists right. in. Aquaman, it means nothing. It's like, <laughs> oh, like anybody who saw the Justice League fight at any point would know that that's Aquaman. Yeah. Like he's he's aquaman like right. that's all anybody any nobody besides people in like a small fishing town mm -hmm. even know who arthur curry is right they know they might know aquaman but they don't know you know so it's not a reveal yeah and it also means nothing to his character personally right. like the iron man quote means uh right. something about uh you know tony stark kind of using you know taking leveraging the the superhero mantle he's taken up mm -hmm. to kind of feed his ego and play into his whole um you know part-time industrialist part-time superhero dynamic and uh, anyway i'm getting too long-winded about this stupid <laughs> quote but like yeah. i can't yeah i when i saw the scene i didn't think like oh this is clearly referencing that mm -hmm. a lot of people that i've talked to felt that way it felt like oh well it's got to be a reference to that because what other superhero movie ends with that and i don't know there are probably some others but yeah i'm trying to think of them the thing that i just kind of thought of now and i don't like i do not think that there is a single person involved in this movie that's clever enough to think that this would be why they, they should do that <laughs> but it's interesting that it's not only in Iron Man, but it's in yeah. Avengers Endgame. And like, I don't oh, yeah, know yeah, if yeah. that's like... Oh, if it's them being like, this is our ending? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, yeah, let's let's cap <laughs> off our franchise by parroting the last line of the famous character from the other franchise. Yeah. Um, it yeah, could even be like... Know. I don't know. This this is way too in the weeds, and then we can talk about the cockroach. But um, <laughs> but like yeah, technically, this isn't even the last frame <laughs> right? of the franchise. But like, I kind of I don't know. Maybe it could be like this is this is so dumb. This is way way overthinking it. But basically, it could be like okay, well, like you know, Iron Man said, "I'm Iron Man." And that was the culmination of the entire Infinity Saga. And maybe this is their way of saying that this is the culmination of the DCEU itself. And like yeah. that, like maybe that's saying like, yeah, MCU sucks now after Endgame, and now the DCEU is done. So this is our yeah. thing. I don't know. It's dumb. Well, and I just, you know, I'm inclined <clears throat> to believe based on the, the lack of passion mm -hmm. and like serious thought put into the final product of this movie mm -hmm. in general, I'm inclined to think that, like maybe it was something as careless thoughtless as mm -hmm. like well you know iron man said his name at the end of his movie that's a fun <laughs> way to end a movie why don't we just have aquaman say his name i like, that honestly that feels like the occam's razor explanation of like 100 percent. that makes the most sense because and i can even spin that into an interesting parallel with the marvel cinematic universe as well because <laughs> like i think that that if that's the case which it could very well be that like jason momoa was like hey what if i just say i'm aquaman and then you give me a story by credit um <laughs> and like and we call it a day yeah. but uh, that it would be fa I would be, I would love to know if that's the case because that would be fascinating considering the fact that the I am Iron Man line was something that was done in post production that they figured like like someone in the writers room or someone was like why don't why doesn't he say that and then they had to rush and get Robert Downey Jr. in to reshoot it and to say yeah. the line and like if that's the case that this is a line that is thrown in is reshot is reshot it would be the perfect 
the <laughs> perfect representation of the passion of the MCU versus the lack of passion in the DCEU. Right, right. I just, I don't know. I kind of love that as a like yeah. pet theory. Um, yeah. yeah. So cockroaches. I, don't know. I think I like the line. Now. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's fun. It's 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 you no, know I'm just like after all this postulating on it, <laughs> yeah. now, you know what? Now I'm glad it ended that way. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a it's not a laugh line. None of the mo- none of the lines in this movie made me laugh, but no, it signaled the end of the movie, and that made me happy. So yeah, right. <laughs> I do have a a positive association with it. Um. So yeah, so the mid credit scene, there's no post credit scene. Mid credit scene has Patrick Wilson eating a cockroach on a burger. <sighs> what does it's that like, say about the MCU versus the DCU? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't begin to pull any meaning no. out of that one. But I do think I do think that's a f- fucking hilarious like final frame of the franchise. Oh my god. Entirely yes entirely not intended i mean you know even if they knew this would be the last one when Mm -hmm. they shot that scene i'm sure they were just like well fuck it at this point why don't we just have a goofy little thing at (laughs) the end you know i don't think there was meant to you know but it is it's a good little like fart noise at the end of this stupid project that (laughs) was the dceu absolutely Um, absolutely yeah I mean, and the joke itself, <laughs> like the cockroach thing is like, I will say maybe the closest thing to a good bit in this movie. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's dumb and derivative and obvious, but like uh, it's kind of cute, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I understand why they called back to it at the end. And, yeah. It's, you know. it's the part of the buddy, the buddy relationship between the two, the two brothers that came closest to maybe working <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah right um i will other- say though oh sorry oh no no it go was, ahead speaking of the cockroach it was funny <laughs> the first you know the first instance of that bit like in the middle of the movie when uh aquaman tells orm that it's a delicacy and he should eat it and he does I thought it was hilarious that like the there were other people in our audience who mm. like verbally viscerally reacted to that <laughs> scene like oh my god oh it's disgusting yeah. and it's like the most obvious fake oh Patrick Wilton yes with an, with an empty hand shoving a CGI <laughs> thing in his mouth and pretending to like you know struggle with the goo of the yeah. inner it's, it's like it's not remotely <laughs> realistic like, or anything. actually gross yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was that was that was tremendous. <laughs> oh Jesus. Um any other thoughts on Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom? <laughs> uh no. Nice. What did you end up rating it on Letterbox? <laughs> I gave it one star. Nice. I you know, I gave it one and a half stars. And yeah. I think I gave it one and a half stars because The movie isn't good. Like, objectively, this is not a good movie. I did not enjoy the movie itself. But I think seeing it with a group and seeing it just, like, living in the absurdity of the death knell of the DCEU is, like, it. I got a little bit of enjoyment out of it. So that bumped it up to one and a half stars. I mean, that's, uh, that's why I gave it a one and not there you go <laughs> <half or nothing. laughs> yes uh, i will say generally like any movie under under two stars so two stars for mm-hmm. me is like this is a bad movie but it didn't like totally piss me off you mm-hmm. know anything under two is like this is terrible and i could not possibly begin to recommend this to anyone right um you know it's a not basically worthless yeah Yeah. i yeah yeah, i'm i'm somewhat of the same mind i i yeah once i get below once i get below two stars it's like that these are movies i'll likely never see again yeah two is like my courtesy rating for a movie i didn't like nice and can't rectify giving a positive review you know it's like this didn't work for me period and i'm just gonna leave it at that that's there a two go. star. And then below that is like, <laughs> actually, I fucking hate this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. Um, <laughs> yeah. But here's the thing, Andy. Uh-huh. 
the DCEU was started by Zack Snyder and it struggled for years and now it's dying. But Zack Snyder is starting a new big Mm. expansive thing. (laughs) Should we go into our secondary review of the evening? Oh, we should. The original opus yes zach snyder jesus christ so rebel moon part one a child of fire uh is currently streaming on Netflix. oh my god yes it's just it's ridiculous (laughs) it is currently streaming on netflix um well i should we do are we gonna bother with a spoiler review on this do you think because i don't uh there's not really like plot details yeah in the movie that i'm interested in like yeah. getting into so we could probably just do it spoiler free and rip it all the same okay yeah let's do that so we're gonna do a non-spoiler review of rebel moon part one a child of fire i'm gonna play a clip from the trailer and then when we come back uh we're gonna be talking about rebel moon part one a child of fire i hate saying that <laughs> the whole time <laughs> so here's a clip from the trailer when i found you in the wreckage of that ship I considered leaving you. I was afraid you could bring trouble to us. What do you think they want? Everything. (sighs) So... (laughs) So, <laughs> Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire. Uh, it's available on Netflix. The premise is, when a peaceful settlement on the edge of a distant moon finds itself threatened by the armies of a tyrannical ruling force, a mysterious stranger living among its villagers becomes their best hope for survival. The movie was directed by Zack Snyder. Writers were Zack Snyder, Kurt Johnstad, and Shay Hatton. And the cast includes Sophie Batella, uh, Jaman Hansu, Ed Screen, Screen? Um, Mikhail Huseman, uh, Bay Duna, Ray Fisher, Charlie Hunnam, and Anthony Hopkins as the voice of Jimmy. Jimmy. Um, <laughs> Everyone's when, favorite. When that came up at the end credits, when it said Anthony Hopkins as the voice of Jimmy, <laughs> like that just, right. I don't know just... why that made me laugh so much. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's an intentional, like, well, we can't say anthony hopkins as jimmy because somebody else did the motion capture oh interesting i don't know so they have to specify voice that's yeah that's interesting i'd be curious well i wouldn't really care less (laughs) anyway uh so andy we we were both at a press screening for this uh so we got to see Zack snyder's magnum opus on the big screen um (laughs) how'd you feel about a child of fire well, it's worth noting that uh, technically this is not Zack Snyder's magnum opus because this That's is not, true. in fact, his true unadulterated cut of the film. Uh, as I understand it, he and Netflix basically yeah. pre-agreed to make two cuts of the film. And so as far as I can comprehend it, he shot this movie with the intent of cutting it two different ways. One PG 13 for initial release, which is what we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. And one that will be rated R that he supposedly got kind of carte blanche to do whatever he wanted with. And he claims it's basically an entirely different movie. (laughs) Um, So, which I didn't know when I watched the film, when I bothered to leave my house to go to a screening of it, I didn't know (laughs) that that was the case. I thought people were making jokes about waiting for the Snyder Cut. Um, I should have listened. Um, Because, yeah, yeah. we're sitting here on this steaming, vapid, worthless (laughs) pile of dog shit. Um, And we're going to spend time talking about it. I've already spent time reviewing it, as have you. Same. Um, and it's not even it's not even the real thing no um and that's how i ended my review by the way i have a review on obsessiveviewer.com and you have one on filmyap.substack.com um that is infuriating to me like, yeah it's it's uh that kind of corporate uh re- attempt to recapture 
the magic of yeah. a, a social movement that happened. Yeah. Which, you know, I don't want to give Snyder Cucks too much credit, but like right. that was a fucking grassroots movement yes. in the in the film industry if I've ever seen one. And and uh, that like at least like they like the Snyder the Snyder Cucks as you call them. Yeah. Uh they were very obnoxious with it. It was very annoying yeah. in my opinion, but horrible. Yeah. But at least it first a it yielded at least it was genuine. It, it genuine. was like it was it genuine. Was what people at least some people wanted. Yes. You know? And it came out of you know, uh, he suffered a tragedy. His family suffered right. a tragedy. Right. And he was able to make his vision of what he wanted to make. As he originally intended. Like, yes. From my under, you know, from at least what the way he talks about it, the Snyder Cut is functionally the movie he was trying to make. Exactly. With and, Justice League. And like, I would say maybe, I mean, it might, it probably is the best to come best thing to come out of the dceu which is not a high bar to cross um but i i will i did enjoy it's the best thing he contributed to the there you go that's that's (laughs) the perfect way to say it um but here in this case it is like you said it is a corporate greed thing trying to capitalize on something that was successful um and i ended my review by saying that it is insulting for them to put out what is essentially a rough draft of his movie like yeah pointedly I mean, uh, so like planning I mean, it's basically, it that way it's basically like a, a cut for tv version you yeah know? like except it's happening beforehand instead of right. after the fact um you know yep. it's just this is not i mean we haven't seen the original so we don't know how much right. different it is but it's like presumably this isn't the movie Zack Snyder wanted to make. No. He he did make it. He agreed to make it. <laughs> yes. So it's not like he can bitch and say, like, right. you know, oh, they took my film from me or whatever. Yeah. But it was a planned thing. Like, it's not undoubtedly not the movie that, like, yeah. If you were excited for the next Zack Snyder movie, you're basically getting shorted here. Right. Because this is not really the movie. Yeah. And I don't know if it is a situation. Like, I'm pretty sure it is like, okay, he shot. Part one, PG thirteen and R rated, and then he also shot part two with the intention of those two those yeah. two s- styles. Like it is incredible. Like it's I can't escape this word. It's insulting. <laughs> like not only did they here okay here's the thing. Not only did he think he had enough material to fill two whole movies like they Uh, came to it and said oh let's make two movies instead of one yeah and let's make extended cuts that are r-rated of those two movies and to have this be the pile of dog shit that comes out of it is insulting to the viewer and yeah i I just yeah i think it's insulting on kind of multiple levels where it's like mm-hmm. I, you know i'm not I, I said in my review i am personally invested in Zack snyder as a filmmaker simply because of how much i have dedicated my you know <laughs> professional film journalism career to mm-hmm. like talking about his work that's not to say <laughs> i like a lot of his work i don't right you know, i i like a couple things um but i think he's an interesting figure in the mm-hmm. industry i think he's a seems like a really nice and genuine guy um So, all told, I am not coming to this movie as a fan who's excited for, like, you know, what what's the next masterpiece Zaddy is going to thrust upon us. (laughs) Yes. But, like, even if you are, and granted, if you're a Zack Snyder super fan, you're probably going to eat this up just because Zack Snyder. Yeah. But I would think if you had any wits about you and you're a Zack Snyder fan and you show up to this, you're also going to be pissed off and disappointed because what are you getting but a chopped up corporate watered down rendition just like what happened with justice league yeah like they're doing the same thing to you as a fan but intentionally this time yep yep and without reason except money absolutely absolutely and like i i had this experience while watching the movie that this is i i always like anytime i I I bring this up. I feel like a little bit of 
uh not imposter syndrome but like i feel like a little bit like okay now i'm now i'm just a pretentious douchebag but uh so i always have to qualify it my favorite movie of all time is seven samurai by kurosawa 1954 Ah, i think it is a perfect movie a perfect plot and it is like the the perfectness of that movie is why it has been adapted and repurposed and reused it is a it is an incredible incredible work of art and to boot you are like a genuine enthusiast connoisseur of that era of filmmaking that that genre samurai films kurosawa exactly uh, like you you have done the work (laughs) to like exactly appreciate and criticize i mean like that formally like yeah also I those have, kinds of movies. Yeah. Also, I have a Seven Samurai shirt, so I'm legit. There you go. Um, and a poster. That's something actually. I don't have. See, so. there you go. Um, but anyway, this is, this is what separates us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so I say that because going into this movie, I did not know that it was his version of Seven Samurai. I went into it not yeah. knowing that it was that it was born from Seven Samurai, Magnificent Seven, A Bug's Life. Um, <laughs> I I did not know that it was using that plot, and I said this in my letterbox review. I said this on Patreon. I said this to the to the like the rep that was running the screening when they asked for feedback. Yeah. I said that this was like watching the dumbest person make the worst version of my all-time favorite movie, and it was physically painful. Yeah. (laughs) Because everything about this movie that takes from Seven Samurai, it's not that it feels like it doesn't understand the magic of Seven Samurai or the magnificence of, of Kurosawa. Like, there is no way... There is no way that someone can take what kurosawa did and replicate that there is no way that like he was he was a genius right but people can and have taken the plot and used it and purposed repurposed it into their own things it's like the hero's journey it's a wonderful template for doing your own thing with exactly and And many people have done that successfully (laughs) exactly and here it's like Zack snyder was like, oh, yeah, Seven Samurai. I think he has said Seven Samurai is his favorite movie. I don't know if he oh. has a shirt, but mm. we'll see. But yeah. um, it's just like he was like, uh, like I put in my, um, uh, in <laughs> it, when, I, when I made my recording for Patreon where I did my immediate reaction where I was just livid throughout it, like <laughs> I named the file Dumb Shit Seven Samurai. Because yeah, this yeah. is what this movie is. It's dumb shit Seven Samurai because nothing from Seven Samurai captures or is even cognizant of the magic of Seven Samurai. Like when yeah. like the collecting of of warriors to defend the farm, it is the most bland, lackluster anything like one of the things I pointed out in my review was one of the basically for those listening the premise is that a tyrannical totalitarian galactic government is you're doing great (laughs) goes to this to this planet with farmers and it's like hey we're gonna take all your crops uh so you need to make us make crops for us um and then they go out to find warriors to defend them so it's seven samurai but any time they collect people it is the most vacuous uninteresting like display for me like there i pointed yeah. this out yeah like I, I pointed this out in my review the one where the guy is is in chains and he is indebted to this farmer it is the dumbest setup and the dumbest payoff to the setup i've seen in a movie in years mm-hmm. um yeah how did you feel uh, like are you are you familiar with the magic of kurosawa and <laughs> um well we you and i have talked about this before yes. i am i am not as um familiar with kurosawa as i would like to be and that's mm. kind of a mission of mine yeah. probably in the new year yeah uh, is is trying to make my my way through um more of his stuff but also just more classic japanese cinema mm-hmm. um 
because he is one of many greats yeah. uh, out of that industry. Anyway. I think um, I've pitched to you an odd trilogy, mm-hmm. um, but I will remind you of that off mic. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, but yes. Uh, anyway. Um, but I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't call myself a Kurosawa head mm-hmm. currently. Um, I will say that like my, how I came to this movie was like as a Star Wars fan. Yes. I, I, I think if, you know, if you are the Kurosawa fan between the two of us, I am the Star Wars mm-hmm. fan. Um, and, <laughs> you know, I, I wish I'd said this in my review, but mm-hmm. as I, as I've indicated, you know, Star Wars was kind of at the front of my mind during this mm-hmm. Seven Samurai was at the front of yours, but it, it really is. It's basically Zack Snyder doing seven samurai by way of star wars yes he's like taking the plot beats of seven samurai and granted they they it's a natural fit because oh, a lot 100%. of star wars is influenced by kurosawa yeah specifically seven samurai mm-hmm. um hidden fortress is a big influence obviously um but he's he's uh He's doing the Seven Samurai story, that plot of the collecting of these, you know, warriors to stand against a greater threat and dressing it in the trappings of Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And that would be a really cool idea if that wasn't already what Star Wars was. You know, it's like he's it's like he it really is like he doesn't understand any of the material that he's adapting. He's just like. I think all this stuff is really cool because I grew up watching it. Mm -hmm. And so now I want to mash it together (laughs) without ever putting in the thought of like, well, maybe that was the point originally and doing it again is just masturbatory. Yeah. Um, And there's, yeah, I mean, to, to like, it really is, you know, the power of inspiration and Mm -hmm. stealing in art and that sort of thing is that you take something that already exists and you, you make it your own. You do something that only you would do with it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I guess to some degree, Zack Snyder did that because he took (laughs) both of those things and made absolute dog shit out of it. Um, But like, I really feel like one of this movie's biggest problems amid an endless list of problems is like, just how unoriginal it is and i i that's a like i it's not a word i use in my criticism a lot because i think original is way overused and misused Mm -hmm. and not not productive in most conversations because so few things are truly like original these days and that's okay like like i said Lots of amazing art is just stealing from other yeah. things. There are seven um, plots, basically, that yeah. anyone can make. Yeah. yeah, and each one is represented by a samurai in Seven Samurai. No. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> in this essay. Um, <laughs> That's, but, yeah, yep. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> there's, there's so little original thought in this. Mm-hmm. And, like, anything that I would, like, Dane to call original is like yeah. so incredibly minuscule and superficial. Like I, I think the way I kind of articulated this feeling in my review was um, like I said, you know, I, I gave you, I gave a whole paragraph of like, well, this character in rebel moon is basically this character in this star Wars, this mm-hmm. plot beat in rebel moon is basically this plot beat from stars. And then I said, but this movie has Jenna Malone as a spider person. (laughs) Star Wars does not have that. And it's like, that is what this movie, (laughs) like that's what constitutes original thought in Mm -hmm. this is like, Oh, well here's a small little aesthetic change. Yep. Here's the, the hyperspace portals look like vaginas. Yeah. What was that? Like, I don't, I couldn't tell you. I yeah. couldn't begin to like I, unravel because I don't, I, I, it's hard for me to even accept that Zack mm-hmm. Snyder is actually putting thought into things like that. Right. But he clearly <laughs> thinks it's cool because he yeah. keeps doing stuff like that. Stuff's got to be phallic or sexual or, yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. Like, here's the thing. And, and with it being like a combination of Seven Samurai and Star Wars, that is something that I find so... I pointed this out in my review. 
it's hilarious to me because that's been done like a few years ago in the Mandalorian episode four. That right. is a I riff mean, on Seven Samurai. Yeah, when I say Star Wars has done it, I mean Star Wars has done it multiple times. Yes. Like it's it's, it's like done. Yeah, it's, it's done. We did it. Yeah, like, Zack it's, Snyder doing it outside of the you know if Zack Snyder wanted and this was originally supposed to be a Star Wars movie this was oh like that's right yeah. to Lucasfilm I don't know if the whole script was shown to them or mm. just the idea but like it was if there was a script <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, but it was circulated to Lucasfilm and they were like now nah, we're good mm-hmm. I imagine because they were like well we've done this a thousand yeah. times um, but yeah it like if he had done this within the confines of that space of the star Wars world and Mm -hmm. mythos, I would almost be more forgiving just because that's like innately part of star Wars DNA is like those samurai stories, those classic, you know, kind of fables that Kurosawa blessed us with. Mm -hmm. Um, But it, it really feels like he thought he stumbled onto something new here. (laughs) Yeah just because like and obviously he's going to because it's his own but he you yeah. know he talks about it like it's well yeah this is my star wars like this is this is me put through the lens of something i love mm-hmm. and it's like i just don't see anything other than cheap empty star wars and seven samurai yeah. like you're you're just doing the thing that has already been done yeah you think it's original because you clearly are just so not yeah and dialed into what those things were exactly and even even when someone like jj abrams does this thing like when he remade yeah. a new hope for <laughs> the force awakens just about <laughs> right, right at least he is conscious enough to make it not stick out quite as much like at least he has like a map or a plan yeah, to make it it's... somewhat original <laughs> Yeah, or it's like you he takes, you know, maybe two characters from the original story and like fuses them into a new character or yeah. like it inverts an archetype uh here or there, you know, yeah. you've got the 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 Skywalker lineage yeah. is now the villain in Kylo Ren, you know, yeah. um and things like that. Make um, one character the grandchild of a dead character that somehow yeah. came back. <laughs> Um, well, JJ didn't know that because JJ doesn't answer questions. He just asks them. Uh, um, Jesus Christ. <laughs> he, I mean, he eventually did have to answer it, but mm-hmm. he didn't know the answer at the time. Yeah. The time before. So <laughs> anyway. Um, Jesus. It's um, just, yeah. I mean, it really is just, and we have barely even talked about like oh anything that actually happens in yeah. the movie, but it's just so, I, I feel like, and this is what I get for even bothering to read discourse about movies I don't like or, mm-hmm. or discourse from people that I don't want to listen to. Um, yeah. This is, you know, I'm doing <laughs> this to myself, but it's just like yeah. to like peruse the internet and see all these people, you know, being like, well, it, it was pretty good actually. It's like Star Wars, but more mature or like <sighs> it's, it's, it's Snyder with, or it's Star Wars with Snyder's stamp and it really delivers. It's like, I just feel like so many people, I feel like in order to enjoy this movie, genuinely enjoy it, genuinely think Mm -hmm. it's a good film, you have to not engage with it. Yeah. And, you know, our our friend Evan Dossie, mm -hmm. actually, that's basically the premise of his review is like, you know what, all told, I didn't hate this movie. (laughs) But my secret is that I barely paid attention to it. Yeah. And I I feel like that is the only way that this movie is even passable, like perceivably Mm -hmm. interesting is if you don't, don't engage with what it's trying to do conceptually. Like, cause if you're aware at all of how it parallels star Wars and Mm -hmm. seven Samurai and all these other, like 15 other things you, you would immediately just, I don't know how you wouldn't feel like, well, this is the least interesting version of all those things i've ever seen absolutely and like just that i I, it's not cognitive dissonance but like that 
that just like disengagement with it in order to enjoy it, enjoy it. I feel like obviously there's audience like people don't a lot of people don't tend to think about movies the way that we think about movies. No, for sure. like, and even though I was going to make this joke, but I didn't want to like in the, in the screening or in my letterbox review, but I was going to say like, all right, I can't wait to go home and tell people how to feel about rebel moon. Um, because that's the, that's the point of being a critic is right. forcing people to, uh, to believe like, like dictating what a person should think about a movie. Exactly. Um, which, of course, I'm being sarcastic. That is not at all what we do. <laughs> that is literally we're sharing our opinions. Um, but like there, like there is an audience for this movie that is yeah. going to enjoy it, have enjoyed it, are going to look forward to part two. Um, I'm not. <laughs> I, I yeah. really, really hate this movie. <laughs> so, right. yeah, I just... I, I, I just... Yeah. Oh, I'm just reading. I just it just popped up on my feed here as we're talking oh, on God. my screen. Uh, the, Zack Snyder claims that the portals in Rebel Moon were not inspired by vaginas. Wow, wow! Uh, which again just goes back to like I don't feel like Snyder like intellectually engages with anything he's no. he's either adapting or creating. Like mm -hmm. I, I think he's just oh, it looks cool. Yeah. And, like, and I think maybe he just naturally finds sexual imagery, imagery cool, mm -hmm. whether or not he recognizes that it's sexual. Right. <laughs> I would like to speak to his therapist. <laughs> it would be very interesting. Yeah, we need somebody to crack this guy open. Yes. I, it's just like, I mean, I don't know. It Again, I feel like there is a, a level of, I don't know where I'm going to come down on Zack Snyder as a filmmaker overall, because no, I do not think he engages, like you said, engages intellectually at all with his, with his work, which, Hey, that's fine. If you want to make a shitty star Wars seven samurai riff, go ahead. The fact that he can is what bothers me when there mm -hmm. are like, sure. There's a vocal audience for Snyder shit, but I feel like it's it's like insulting. This is again the pretentious Seven Samurai shirt uh, owner speaking, hmm. but like, like Netflix could have given tons of money to someone else who actually has something to say to make a movie right. and market it, but they gave it to Zack Snyder for this to make this shitty yeah. movie twice. Right, yeah, four times. <laughs> four times, um, yes, yes. Well, what I don't know is if the, because part two comes out in April, which is right. insane. Yeah. Um, we don't have a release date yet on the extended cut of right. this part one, I don't think. So what I don't know is maybe the maybe the the Snyder cut will be like the Justice League Snyder cut, where it's like maybe they'll put both parts into one big six hour clusterfuck or something. I could definitely see that, you know, and Just otherwise, I mean, surely even Netflix is thinking, well, we'd really be milking it if we released director's cuts of both parts, right. you know, so maybe it's, we'll lump it all into one. Yeah. And, and if the chapter were... markers, like, right. like Justice League. yeah. Oh, Jesus. Um, they could even do like, I'm not to say if they were smart, but they could even do like a, like a physical release of the entire thing sure. and cash in that way. Yeah. Um, as well, I don't know. It's or just a steel book collector's edition with, yep. with life size glowing vagina <laughs> portal. Yes. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, okay. Is there anything else that you want to talk about with rebel moon? <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to think there's definitely, I mean, there are yeah. tons of things we've not even, you know, touched on yeah. just because it's, there's so much, but it's, yeah. I mean, I think everything we've said so far is kind of the core of the movie is exactly. just, it's just this vapid hollow yeah. thing. And, you know, it, like if you watch it and you enjoy it, more power to you. Absolutely. I, I hope i hope you 
find the same level of enjoyment from much better things yes. and and i hope you know you find other things that will enrich you because this this will not um, absolutely yeah <laughs> and like if you don't want to commit the two hours and 13 minutes to this disney plus has the fourth episode of the mandalorian <laughs> they yeah, do like this, 25 minutes <laughs> yeah i think it's like 41 minutes for oh, for that it? entire okay. episode and like a lot of people actually didn't like that episode, The Mandalorian. I obviously just loved it, but um, I think Bryce Dallas Howard directed that. She episode, did, didn't she? Yep. Yeah. I think um, honestly, that was my biggest issue was that with that episode was that it was directed by a woman. No, oh um, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> and no, wow, I, just, I, I think my <laughs> if I remember right, my nitpicks with that episode because it's a good episode were mm. just the the direction wasn't totally there. Okay, that's fair. Um. Yeah, I liked it, but also check out Seven Samurai. It's on Criterion Channel yeah. and HBO Max. Um, I don't think Magnificent Seven is really streaming anywhere. Um, that's a movie I need to the original? watch. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say I feel like the Chris Pratt one is somewhere, but I don't ooh, know. yeah, I actually put in my letterbox review that during Antoine Fuqua's uh, remake of Magnificent Seven in 2016, I remember thinking this isn't good. But I love Seven Samurai so much that any variation of that story will have me will have at least something for me to enjoy. <laughs> and then yeah. I saw Rebel Moon. <laughs> yeah, whoops. yeah, which is a good segue to what was your rating for Rebel Moon? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, on Letterboxd, mm-hmm. I gave it half a star mm-hmm. because that's the lowest rating you can give on Letterboxd. Because if you don't give at least half a star, it doesn't register as a rating. Yeah. Um, However, I also added it to a list that I made on Letterboxd, actually a list I made specifically as a reaction to this film Mm -hmm. uh, (laughs) called Movies I Would Give Zero Stars if Letterboxd allowed me to. Nice. Um, I think this is quite literally a worthless film. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of quote unquote worthless movies that aren't necessarily zero stars. But like, I think genuinely there is... You know, Aquaman, terrible fucking movie. Mm -hmm. There were brief glimpses of things where I was like, ah, that was, you know, an interesting piece of filmmaking for five seconds. Or, oh, that was pretty. Or, oh, that was almost funny. I I didn't feel like a single positive thing about this movie during its entire two-hour runtime. Like, it's... I would really struggle to come up with something nice to say about it. Absolutely. And I think it's all a hundred percent bad. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And and to just pinpoint it, it's it's like I said, it's a rough draft of one half of a story that has been told many yeah. times in many different forms by much more talented people. Like yeah. just don't don't get me wrong. Stop. Don't get me wrong. I will fucking watch the Zack Snyder version when it oh, comes yeah, out. Oh, yeah, 100%. I'm there, because... two, I'm there for part two. I'm there for R-rated <sighs> cut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've watched everything Snyder has done. Mm-hmm. I've disliked most of it. So, like, I'm not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. And I'm not writing this off. I also, you know, I am very much open to the fact or the possibility of the Snyder cut actually having some merit. Mm-hmm. I... I am not convinced or optimistic <laughs> that it will be good. Right. But it may have something to it, something, something inherent, innately Snyder about yep. it that makes it makes me think, oh, this is why he had to make this movie. Mm-hmm. Because I did not feel any of that. Yeah. And, no. Even with Anthony Hopkins as the voice of Jimmy, um, yeah. I couldn't draw me in. Um, as K2SO. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that's our kind of roundabout review of rebel moon i rated it half a star i just i uh, it was awfully generous of you matt it it was it honestly was i when i when i was going to publish my review i was like waffling between half a star zero stars yeah but yeah 
Uh, so, okay, well, let us know what you thought of uh, of Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire. Of course, you can email in at matt at obsessiveviewer.com and reach out to Andy on Letterbox at uh, letterbox.com slash dandable. Um, yeah. So to kind of close out the episode, I did have one bit of potpourri, um, and I was going to ask if you had anything. You said before the show that you don't really have anything. So if you don't have anything for potpourri, can you tell like one or two movies that you're looking forward to in 2024? Um, Aside from part two, The Scar Giver. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think last time I was on, I talked about Love Lies Bleeding. Yes. Um, gosh. Uh, does... I think Sonic three comes out next year. Um, I, I, I wouldn't, I, it'd be, it'd be an overstatement to say I was excited. Mm -hmm. Um, I still haven't seen the second one, Um, but the third one is introducing, I'm talking about Sonic the Hedgehog for Mm -hmm. those who are unclear. Um, The third one is introducing shadow, the hedgehog, which is maybe the funniest, certainly the edgiest, addition to sonic lore um (laughs) and so i'm just just perversely curious about how they're gonna how they're gonna implement that um didn't someone tease that they were or was that a bit i can't remember yeah i I, want to say somebody teased that they were playing him but i don't remember if that was ever like confirmed or who it was um but yeah no like in like the video game shadow the hedgehog has a fucking gun so (laughs) are they gonna put (laughs) You know, is going to have a Desert Eagle or a sniper rifle in the <laughs> Sonic movie God. starring Jim Carrey and James Marsden? Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> I just, no, 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 anyway, <laughs> I just I'm, I Googled it. And I'm like, There's a vulture headline that from November. That's shadow to presumably bring dark sexual edge to Sonic 3. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just. Sonic is already not like a super edgy franchise. I'm not right. like a super fan or anything, but you know, I've, I've been around. Um, but the movies especially are way like even more have that like kid friendly bent to them. It's kind of like the, yeah. you know, the super Mario movie took mm-hmm. like an overtly, <laughs> we are trying to grab kids with this one angle. And that's kind of what the Sonic movies have done. And so the contrast between most of Sonic lore and shadow was already funny, but mm. now it's even more fascinating to me because it's like, he just does not belong in, <laughs> in stuff like this. So I don't know. That's something I'm looking forward to. I wouldn't nice. say I'm like hyped about it, but I'm like, I have to see it. That's excellent. Well, yeah. Sonic three is expected in December of 2024. <laughs> oh God. I got to wait the whole year. I know. Yeah. So uh, we'll. I sh- I'll have to hedge my bets on something else. <laughs> exactly, hedge hog your bets. Um, <laughs> hey, hedge my hog. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I'll close this out with potpourri. What I'm what I'm planning on doing throughout 2024, when I can, since I am committing to hopefully maintaining a weekly release schedule of obsessive viewer podcast episodes, on the weeks in which I have the opportunity to watch something extra before recording. Um, I have a list on letter, a private list on letterbox. That's just, um, OV potpourri 2024. And basically what I'm going to do is when I have a, when I have like a free evening before recording that week's episode, I will go to that, uh, list and I will shuffle it on letterboxd and I will watch something from that for potpourri. So, uh, that's my goal for, to do intermittently, uh, when I can throughout 2024. And what came up last night was uh, Noah Baumbach's The Meyerowitz Stories New and Selected from 28 or 20, 2017. Um, stars Adam Sandler and uh, a bunch of people, Ben Stiller, <laughs> Dustin Hoffman, Emma Thompson. Um, I am someone who really enjoys Noah Baumbach but I have some very big um, uh, blind spots. Like Marriage Story was my favorite movie, my number one movie of 2019. Um, Yeah, yeah, it was great. And uh, what was the other one? I remember seeing, I'm trying to look here. What was the name of the movie? Oh, Mistress America. I remember seeing that at Indie Film Fest um, and just really, really liking it. Um, And Meyerowitz Stories is freaking incredible have you seen it yeah i really like that movie yeah i have not seen 
a ton of bomb back, but I've mm-hmm. seen like pretty much all his big ones of the last few years, certainly. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I stumbled across Myrowitz stories on Netflix or something mm-hmm. a few years ago and watched it and was like, yeah, uh, so what a, what a good little, it's a cozy movie and it's an interesting movie about family and yeah. Yeah. I like that one family, family dysfunction. Uh, the dialogue is what always gets me in a bomb back movie. Um, mm-hmm. and here it is incredible. Absolutely incredible. Um, uh, our friend, great. Oh yeah. He's amazing. Adam Sandler's amazing in it. Mm-hmm. Um, the way that it depicts this family that has so many different, like I wrote on letterbox that I don't know how he, how Noah Baumbach makes family dysfunction and complex family dynamics look so effortless. And yeah. there is just that naturalistic way that the dialogue uh, like plays out and just it's not played for high drama or melodrama it's just these characters exist and they have their own issues with each other and within the family their own insecurities all of these things that just come across so well in the dialogue um after okay. i posted it on letterboxd our friend brent messaged me and was like hey i don't know if you've seen this but this is a really great video about uh the dialogue that noah Bombach like is so good at and it's like an eight minute video deconstructing a couple of scenes from the Meyerowitz stories and it's like it's it perfectly encapsulates Mm -hmm. what's um what works so well about the dialogue in this movie um I'll put a link in the show notes to it but I really really enjoyed this movie and I really need to go back through Bombeck's uh catalog and and watch more of this stuff yeah um, yeah, so that is the Meyerwitz stories, new and selected. It is on Netflix. Um, that will do it for this week's edition of the Obsessive Viewer podcast, uh, the first of 2024. Andy, thank you so much for joining me once again. Um, yeah. w- if you don't mind, could you tell people where they can find you online and all of your, all of your stuff? Yes. And, uh, and thank you so much once again for having me on. Of course. Um, I am happy to indulge during these winter months yes and uh um it's a it's a joy yes. um anyway <laughs> uh yeah you can find me on letterbox at letterbox.com slash dandable um on to twitter and instagram at not so handy andy um i occasionally post some some filmy takes there too um and odd trilogies mm-hmm. on instagram and twitter and facebook and all the sites where you listen to podcasts and odd trilogies.castos.com nice nice (laughs) and uh yeah you guys are going to definitely want to subscribe to odd trilogies the episode that they're coming out with this week is going to be a monumental episode it's the year interview i'm excited to listen to it lots of Um, fantastic movies being talked about yes yes do you have any uh, like on the on the on the on the radar for 2024 that you can reveal in this or just leave it for people to listen to in 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 your Um, podcast you know i haven't done my obligatory research into 2024 Uh, releases to to say for sure what which ones i'm going to be spotlighting Um, (laughs) gotcha hence hence why i ass pulled for sonic 3 earlier Um, (laughs) nice (laughs) nice well you still have we will definitely definitely be talking about uh those very nice very nice well once again andy thank you so much for uh joining me for this uh first episode of 2020 oh my god 2024 um it's been a blast looking forward to having you on more uh whenever i'm able to uh corral you into or or manipulate you into coming onto the show manipulate away yes i am your puppet nice nice now it's on record so (laughs) uh thank you guys so much for listening and i'll see you in the next episode and now enjoy this short clip from our patreon exclusive feed for this and more exclusive content join our patreon at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer um I, I'll talk about this later, but the whole uh, day marrying the queen of 
Dominion or whatever. That went right over my head. No idea. We'll talk about that here in a bit. But that was just something that I was just like, I was, I was worried because as the, as the, plot was under uh was was unfolding i was like is this stuff i should have remembered from season one because i have no memory of it so we'll see but anyway back to harry selden uh as he's in the prime radian thank you for listening to the obsessive viewer podcast this episode was produced and edited by me matt hurt if you have feedback thoughts on our reviews or just want to connect you can email me at matt at obsessiveviewer.com For more information on all of our shows, including a full archive of our episodes and show notes, plus plenty of written reviews, visit obsessiveviewer.com. If you enjoyed the show, please give us a follow on social media and subscribe to us on your podcast app of choice so you never miss an episode. Also, consider rating and reviewing the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Audible to help increase our visibility and help grow our community. If you want to support the show and help keep us going while getting early access to new episodes as well as a steady stream of exclusive content, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Our theme song is A Little Mad Sometimes by As Good As It Gets. For more of their music, check them out on Spotify and at asgoodasitgetsmusic.com. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.